lesson of failing so hard at building technology for four years, working really hard, 100 hour weeks or 80 hour weeks, whatever extremity we were pushing ourselves to, and still falling so flat on your face. It's a very humbling experience where it really taught us that the answers to building a great company aren't in my head or aren't in my co-founder Harrison's head, but they live outside the four walls and they live in the heads of our potential customers. Welcome to Entrepreneur's Handbook Podcast, where we share inspiring startup stories with practical takeaways for you, the listener. Today's guest is Vasu Pratipati, who's the founder of Maestro QA. Vasu didn't have an easy journey to where he is today, where he struggled to find a job after university and then built a business which for many years didn't quite seem like it was ever going to take off. Now they've got over 31 million in funding after their Series A and have clients such as Monday.com and ClassPass, where they're changing the face of customer service for these businesses to make them much more effective and a way to be a differentiator in their industries. Let's go on to the show. Welcome to Entrepreneur's Handbook, Vasu. It's a pleasure to have you here. Hey, thank you so much and uh, for having me and excited to be here. So I've read into your story a bit and you've got a really interesting journey to how Maestro QA came about and how you met your co-founder. Can you talk to us about where your journey started right at the beginning. Why did you become an entrepreneur? Why did you choose this life? Yeah, I mean, where the journey started, it sometimes happens way bo- way earlier in your life than you actually realize, than what you would typically mark as the milestone. But the most literal part of the timeline was sometime in my senior year of college, I started, I knew I wanted to leave and leave college and start my own company and take a bet on myself then and uh, in large part to the person who made the connection our introduction Karthik Kosanaga a professor of mine yeah so I mean I started it right out of pen and uh, I had an idea based on Karthik's work at pen which was based on multi-touch attribution it was how do you understand if you're a consumer and you see 10 ads and then you go buy something which ad contributed what percentage to that purchase? How much did it influence you? And Karthik at Penn, along with a professor named Pete Fader and this other professor from Carnegie Mellon, they were working on all sorts of data science research. So basically, back in 2013, AI was on the earliest phase of becoming a buzzard in the world of technology. And they had this insane, te- this insane math where it was like, if you could take all this math and data online on your website, website data, you could somehow predict how likely someone is going to purchase and what ads can influence someone, what percentage. And I was naive, and but I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Like, wait, you tell me I can take a bunch of math and I can predict the future? Like, of course, this is a great product idea. We learned four years later that wasn't a great idea, but we learned a lot of other lessons along the way. But it was that moment where I was like, why would I not take this bet on myself? A combination of not getting any jobs. I went over 50 in the interview process over my junior and senior year and uh, a little bit of mindset luck to say, screw it. Like, let's go for it. That put me on this journey. And I would say every, that's one of the greatest lessons in life. Ignorance is bliss because if I knew what I was about to be on, I'd never do it. But uh, I'm so glad because I couldn't imagine myself doing it ever again not doing it. And I hope I have the privilege to always get to do what I do today. What did you learn from that first startup that didn't work out? What were the hard lessons you learned there? Well, it's so it's still the same startup. We just made a really hard pivot. Um, There's so many lessons, one very tactical about company building, and then a lot of personal growth uh, learnings, which I'm proud of both, but definitely more proud of the personal growth ones, because they you can draw a change in my development as a human being since that experience. But you know, for the first call it four years, I've been at it for 10 years with my co-founder and founding team. And for the first four years, we, we've been together the whole time. But for the first four years, we were building an idea based on this paper from Karthik and his co- and his uh, other professors that he worked on it with. And over the course of those four years, we built a lot of technology based on this paper. And we spent a lot of time inside four walls r- writing code, not me writing code, they were writing code. And I was trying to go and pitch what they were building. And we learned two lessons. The tactical lesson is how much cool ideas don't matter if you're not actually solving a problem for a customer. 
and how important it was to not work from technology first, problem second, but what is going on in the world? What are people really struggling with? And work backwards towards a solution. How do you go out and talk to folks and truly listen, truly ask questions of curiosity, collect a variety of data, and then do the hard work of finding the patterns of what you're listening to, to then come up with a solution. And that lesson of failing so hard of building technology for four years, working really hard, 100-hour weeks or 80-hour weeks, whatever extremity we were pushing ourselves to, and still falling so flat on your face, it's a very humbling experience where it really taught us that the answers to building a great company aren't in my head or aren't in my co-founder Harrison's head, but they live outside the four walls and they live in the heads of our potential customers and we try and always remember as a company today, it's like when we have ideas, we, we constantly ask like what conversations with customers are informing it. Not even data like on metrics and dashboards and engagement metrics. We index so heavily on actual conversations with customers. And so that was an incredible lesson that shaped the culture post pivot to where we found a lot more success, where we are incredibly customer conversation oriented. I don't even use customer oriented because You could say you look at a bunch of customer metrics and say you're customer oriented, but I really mean like, you know, talking to customers, building relationships, then really listening to them. So that was the very tactical business lesson we got out of it. Uh, The more personal business lesson, the the more personal lesson we got out of that business experience is I went to Penn. That's a great school on paper. Uh, My co-founder went to MIT. That's a great school on paper. You think, you know, these are pretty smart people, you know, and we... Thought we were pretty smart as hell. We could read some stuff online, come up with a good idea. And the significantly more interesting lesson is just how dumb we actually are. Like we're book smart, but not street smart. Where we have all the, you know, and we are smart in our own ways, but we're not that smart. You know, we're not smarter than the world. And what it taught us was just, man, be humble, listen first. You have to take bets. You have to have conviction. You have to have the right amount of ego and arrogance to go take a bet. But it starts with listening and understanding and being really critical about your own opinions and trying to be open to how am I wrong? Where am I missing something? And so that's just an incredible lesson of humility that we also have drawn an incredible personal growth line. And you can see it in the values of how we work with others that we really try and coach others to be too, in addition, hold ourselves accountable too. So those are, I would say, the personal lessons and the business lessons. On the personal lesson side, That's true, right? Because people go to study entrepreneurship or they study these complicated subjects and reality is always going to be different to how you do the theory. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult, right? Because it's it's an attack on your pride in a way where you think you know it's the right thing to do. And like you said, part of the reason of becoming an entrepreneur, you've got to believe that you can do it better than other people. But at the same time, you've got to listen and trying to find that balance is really difficult. Was there a particular moment that triggered that for you? Or did you think it was just over time, suddenly that realization kicked in? Yeah, I mean, there's a nuanced thing that you said there that I want to draw a thread, which is as an entrepreneur, you get feedback from so many different sources. You're always getting feedback. And it's your job as an entrepreneur to figure out what is good feedback and what is shit feedback. And that's a very hard thing because that feedback is coming from a lot of credible places, like your investors. You know, but oftentimes investors are giving you shit feedback, but they're smart and they're giving you some money too. You know, like it's hard not to like pay attention to what they have to say. And every single person's feedback, even if it's shit feedback overall, have moments of truth. So how do you figure out the moments that are true and find the truth in what they do have to say and know what parts to ignore? Because some investor might give you feedback and part of their feedback is you should do this. Maybe you don't have to do that. You do the actual thing they're asking you to do. But maybe what you can say is, well, why did you give me that feedback in the first place? What problem are you observing? And they state the problem they're observing. And all you have to do is pay attention to the problem and use that as feedback and come with your own solution. Um, So what you start to realize is how do you find – you don't take feedback as you like it or not, but you try and find genuine curiosity of the truth in it that really resonates. So that's one area. It's like don't look at feedback so black and white, but try and find the truth in it. And uh, it'll only serve you if you have low ego and high drive and high self-belief that you can take feedback and channel it into positive energy. Um, The second thing, though, but this is much easier to apply, like in business, there's one area of feedback that matters more than anyone. It's your customers. So we we got a lot of feedback along the journey and we tried our best to listen to it and apply it, but we didn't do too well. But eventually we just try to sell, sell, sell and fail, fail, fail at getting customers 
And that's the best source of feedback. It's like, okay, I, I need to take a step back and stop pushing my agenda and start collecting data and learning. And uh, I think that was going back to what I said earlier. That's why it was so easy to realize we were not onto something. And talking to my fellow peers of founders and listening to people that are multiple stages ahead of me. And I remember hearing this line that was very elucidating, which was, it's by, it was by Lou Cern. He was speaking at a Saster conference, which is a conference, a SAS centric conference. And Lou Cern, who was the founder of New Relic, he said something along the lines that a startup is like a boulder rolling downhill and you have to put the guardrails to make sure it doesn't fall off. And in my head, I always thought of a startup as something, a boulder you're pushing uphill. And I was always pushing up. I was like, okay, I'm going to got to keep pushing. This is the journey I'm on. But then when I realized that, I was like, oh, I'm definitely selling something that doesn't solve a problem. That's why we're pushing a boulder uphill and it's time to make a change. Can you explain for the audience as well, what was the pivot? So what was the company doing before the pivot? And from the customer feedback, what did they then drive and what changes did that make? to then lead to the success you've had now. Yeah, so what we were doing before the pivot was, again, based on that paper by Karthik, which was how do we analyze this website data to understand what percentage an ad contributes to a purchase? And so it's very much the marketing tech, marketing attribution, marketing analytics space. I won't even try and connect the dots, at least initially, unless we really want to go into it. But what we do today, just to show you how stark of a pivot it is, is... We uh, help customer support teams analyze their customer service conversations to identify insights into what are good customer experiences and what are bad customer experiences, and then help them take action on that insight through coaching their customer support reps to have better conversations. When did you gain your first customers for the, after the pivot? How did you know that this was the right path to take and keep pushing further down that? There's an interesting moment because like, how do you know is the right path? By the time you know it's the right path is an extreme. Like right is a, you know, that's when you have 10, 20, 30 customers. So like you, when you make that path, you still have to take a leap of faith. But I'll tell you a couple interesting heuristics. It's so you can think of it as like a, a curve where you're working towards 100% certainty, 100% right. Okay, so what was the first milestone on that curve? Well, lesson one, we said in our previous product, we said we were trying to create a new behavior. Hey, marketer, you're not doing this today, but here's a better way to do what you're doing. You just have to spend three hours a week on this new thing, and it's going to deliver better results. And people are really busy. We have low trust. Like, why do we don't even come from the industry? Why were we so arrogant to think that we could show them a better way, you know, without actually really being there? Okay. So first thing that we that gave us from 0% certainty to like, say, 10% certainty was, we I interviewed folks and we, we were asking about how they were spending their time today. What are their current behaviors? And uh, what got us from 0% to 10% is we saw, the, how cust we saw that people were customer service teams were spending time analyzing customer service conversations for these insights. So they cared so much about the problem that they're committing their time. Nothing was more. We, we had this line that we don't care. If people think what we do, like what we do is a good idea or not, we care if they're actually spending time today on solving this problem in whatever way. So that gave us some level of confidence. Um, that was phase one. So we were honing in. We're, we're not going to build any products unless it was solving a problem someone was already spending time on. So then we found a problem across 10, 20 people we spoke to that they're spending time on. Then number two, what took us from 10% confidence to 30% confidence? Uh, we asked these people, hey, you're spending time on this. Here's a potential idea on how we can make it a lot better. Would you partner with us on building a solution together? And our first three partners were Blue Apron uh, when they were in their heyday. I mean, they're not who they were then, but they were like the hottest company in Silicon Valley right up there at that time. Harry's Razors, similar, and Bonobos. Just like these three like very well-regarded brands, in at least the world of e-commerce and, and startups. And I would go into their office, my co-founder and our founding team, we would go into their office and we co-develop. And we saw not only did they partner with us when we had no product, they would invite, spend time weekly or sometimes daily to build this together and give us feedback. So we knew that they not only believed in us and that we had an opportunity to solve their problem, they're spending more time with us to help co-partner with it. And everyone slammed, right? So time, we felt, was just, again, going back to a, a significantly higher signal than willingness to pay. 
there could be a world like on our previous product, we got golf channel, you know, that's a recognizable brand to give us a hundred K. But sometimes as founders, you have this superpower being really charismatic, really passionate. People will buy into you and they'll give us money because they believe in the person but even if we're not really solving a great problem. And so you can get blind. So we learned that in our previous thing, like, no, no, we sold the product, but it was like pushing a boulder uphill and it was like one out of hundred and we got money and we thought that was a signal, but it was a false signal because we didn't realize how much charisma a founder could actually have in influencing a person versus actually solving a true problem. So then we said, okay, they're spending so much time with us, which was incredibly higher assets. So that took us from 10% to 30%. And then there was this pivotal moment. Okay, we built this thing. It was solving this problem. And we were like, is this something we really want to go all in on? And we had not only me and Harrison, but we had three or four other people from MIT. And the only reason we were able to, we had a fork in the road. We were like, do we want to go all in on this? Or do we want to find a more tough technical problem to solve? Because one of our engineers was like, can't they just buy two monitors and solve this problem? Like, cause it was a workflow thing. And we were like, well, that's like a monitor costs like 50 bucks, hundred bucks max for a lifetime. And we sat there and we were like, fuck, like maybe this isn't a good business idea, but this is what we said. We failed. We were so smart and we failed so hard last time. Let's not overthink it and be that smart here. If they're spending time with us and they want to do this, let's just freaking go for it. And we ended up being able to take our initial price point from $5 an agent to over six to seven exit over the time. Because we started, we weren't too confident how much value we were adding. And that took us from 30% confidence to 50% confidence we could raise the price. But then here was the golden moment. Here's what took us from 50% to call it 90%. One of our investors is a guy named Jason Lemkin, and he's an incredible thought leader. Of He gives you very simple insights that are highly nuanced and insightful. It's like simple yet incredibly insightful. And he has this blog post where he says, listen, people are going back to the time thing. People are so busy. There's a thousand SaaS apps there. If you find 10 customers that come to your website and buy your product and they're not your friends. They're not your friends of friends. They're not your mom buying the software. They're not like some through something like that, but totally unaffiliated customers, 10 unaffiliated customers. You have to recognize how low probability that is to actually happen in the world's chaos. And we got 10 affiliated customers. We threw up a website. We got Sophos, a security company in India, uh, or based in London, actually. We got Credit Karma that came to us. We got CUNY was our one of our first customers, a, a university in New York City, a public university in New York City. And we just started to get 10 unaffiliated customers. And we had that blog post. And that's when we went from like close to 75 to 90% certainty that like we were really onto something. That if we could get to 10, we get to 100. And now we're multiples of that. You said that at the time the team was about six people. So I guess because you're that lean, it was a bit easier to make the decision. Whereas if you had built up the team further, you didn't have to make any of those tough decisions about if you'd invested a lot of time and a lot of people into building the previous product, you might have had to let some of them go or to have those difficult decisions there. But looking at that early team, you've got a really interesting story about how you met your founder in the first, your co-founder in the first place. Could you talk about that a bit more? Yeah, I mean, uh, so my co-founder is Harrison Hunter. And he, like I mentioned, he went to MIT, but we didn't have that. Like we weren't like working together on side projects on the internet because we were both on like GitHub or some open source community. We didn't grow up together. And uh, when I graduated from Penn, I moved to New York City and I was staying on some friends' couches for that first year. One of my first things was like, especially because the product we were working on was going to be this like heavy machine learning product from the based on that paper. So I got to find a highly technical co-founder that has a passion for machine learning, data and analytics, that type of thing. And I didn't have that network at Penn. And uh, I was like, okay, but I knew that startups were going to be tough. And this was like my first test to see if I was going to be a real entrepreneur or not, or if I was going to be phony and just say, I want to do it, but not actually overcome the obstacles that come with it. And so I viewed it as that first uphill challenge and I was on angel list and I was just like, this was an angel list in 2013. Like startups were way, are way cooler now than even 2013, you know, like even then I thought I was late to the world of startups, but no, like back looking back, like angels was a small community. Now it's got so much more noise and it's a much different place than it used to be. But I would just cold message folks on angel list and, uh, 
Harrison had a really interesting background, not only the fact that he's from MIT, but like some of his work, he was working in an artificial intelligence lab at MIT. And so I just pinged him and he was interning uh, in, at, in New York City at a hedge fund because he's like three, four years younger than me. And I just graduated. But I pinged him and said, hey, I'm working on this paper. Here's the paper. I'm trying to start an idea out of this. Would you want to meet up for coffee? And we met up at a coffee shop in Union Square, which is a central part of New York City. And we just started jamming on the idea. But when we really started to commit and go on all in was a, you could call it almost a year plus recruiting process, 18 months. But uh, now it's 10 years later. And in that time, though, uh, he had recruited his co- his really close friends from MIT who he was on the track team with. And uh, that was made the founding team, which is an incredible team. Like I, I never took it for granted. I always realized how incredible it was. But only over time and you get wiser, you start to understand what made it click in ways that I didn't even realize because it just worked from a co- – the company didn't work for four years. The product didn't work. The there's many poor decisions, but the group of people freaking worked in ways that I didn't, un- I didn't have the wisdom to dissect uh, until probably now um, in many ways. I'd love to see you dissect that. Like what makes it work so well between you, between you and Harrison? Well, let's start maybe here. Like, but we can me and Harrison, I'll, we can zoom in on, but we can also use that founding team. Let's to paint how like, on non-obvious it is it, so what would be obvious oh we were both engineers we were both badass engineers at somewhere okay could, maybe you can see how it clicks no like we're so polar opposite on the surface level in that founding team so harrison ran track and uh, at mit and all the people he recruited to, ran track at mit right i never ran track i actually hate running you know i hated the, i never enjoyed the sport of running and they'd always talk about their times i was like okay you can talk about your times but like i don't give a hoot about this they are very engineering heavy and math heavy. And I was technically in a business school and even pre-med in college. And I know like I was okay, math competent enough, but like they were leagues above me, you know, they would, you know, they'd had all these different passions than I did in so many ways. So like on Harrison six, eight, on five, seven, just like just even a physical start difference there. And so there were so many reasons we were different. And when I look back on it, because people ask and I, you know, you, as you reflect on it, there's a, the, one most binding thing that is really influencing how we think about things going forward in the company building process is we're both highly ambitious, highly competitive, highly oriented around our goal success versus our individual success, have the self-confidence that we don't care about our ego and care about other people, the overall success. And when you set that as the foundation, like it's just an incredible amount of trust. And then there's a high enough horsepower between that founding team where we trust each other's logic, intellect. And then maybe the kicker is our willingness to learn from our mistakes. Like we had that and that was just incredible. We, When we meet people who seem a little full of themselves or unaware of where they're great and not great, we just it just gives us a level of suspicion that uh, – we both, uh, that founding team and me and Harrison in particular have a lot of kindred energy around. And I think that really uh, makes it click. And I don't think I would have been able to say that the first year we worked together or the second year that worked together, the third year. I can literally only say that I probably would have realized this last year. So in year nine and 10, that's how long some of these things take uh, for at least someone as smart as I am. Maybe smarter people figure it out sooner. Like in those first four years, did you ever doubt the decisions you made? Did you ever worry whether you shouldn't have become an entrepreneur because things weren't working out? Or did you always have this belief that things would work out eventually? Was there any point where you're thinking, maybe I should be doing something different? And it might not be a nine to five job. It might be just something where another business. That's a great question. I would say no, but I'll say, I'll give you a more nuanced answer. That's not because I thought the outcome of success was inevitable. It's not because I couldn't imagine myself doing anything else. It's largely because I had the perspective that this shit is tough and this was part of the journey. And the only reason I would doubt myself is if I gave up and that was within my control. Um, it was, I, ne- I was also so caught up in, su- in not giving up and trying to succeed. I didn't give myself the time to think about it. Like it would have been, it was all going to end at the same time. 
Like if it was going to fail, it was going to fail at the very last hour and all the, like all those moments would have happened then and all those thoughts would have happened then. And if it was going to succeed, I, I would have just blown right through that because in many ways we're fa- I'm failing in my role today and I need to sit, do better to succeed. Like it's not like we've become a massive success or we're anywhere close to our aspirations. So like in the journey, there's always moments of failure and success. And I knew that was part of it. And I knew that the only I knew I was cut from the cloth that uh you just, it, it's part of like, this is every one of those moments was the opportunity to figure out how, what you're really made of and how you persist through it. And there's doubts of like, when am I going to figure out? What is the time? Am I going to get the next decision? Right. Was it, is this the right decision? There's definitely doubts on like the decisions are going to be the right ones or not. But when it, at least up to this point and, you know, so, you know, again, ignorance might've been bliss in, at, at the, in those stages of my life. And I hope I continue to be ignorantly blissful for the rest of my life. Cause I feel like there's, you want to be wise, but sometimes wisdom is a, is a, it, it makes you overthink things. So I think uh, my mindset and uh, hopefully I, I haven't asked Harrison this, but hopefully his was just like, you just got to give it all you got and make sure you don't leave anything on the floor. Uh, but uh, I don't think I ever, w- I never was like, cause my parents wanted me to be a doctor. Like I was never like, Ooh, maybe should I apply back to medical school? Definitely not. I was like, Oh, maybe I'll go into finance. Like my peers. Definitely not. I was like, <laughs> so I definitely know those thoughts never occurred. <laughs> and like early on in terms of like raising in money as well, you had quite a fortunate um, encounter with Nahal, right? Who yeah. Then grew to become one of your investors and to help basically create grow. Can you tell the audience about what happened there? Like what was the story behind that? The first year I graduated Penn and I'd met Harrison that first summer, but we were just starting to try and work, work together I obviously didn't have money. I didn't have much saved up. And I was staying on a variety of friends' couches for that first year. And I realized I would always seek out help to figure out this entrepreneurial journey. And a very serendipitous moment occurred, which was a friend of mine at Penn. Her name was Beth Dorn. She had a little brother that worked for Nahal as an assistant. And Nahal was going to go, uh, or David was going to go. I think it was like to Harvard at that point. So he was like taking this assistant job and he was, there was going to be a vacancy and his job was to fill it. So he probably told his sister, hey, I'm leaving. If you know anyone, I'm kind of interested. And Beth was like, hey, my brother's leaving. This guy's in the hall. Here's his like, look him up on the internet. Do you want to meet him? And I said, okay, yeah, definitely. Like I would love to do something. Uh, I would love to get to work for an entrepreneur to hopefully improve the odds of my success of being an entrepreneur. And I love like his background, his network. There's a lot of great things that uh, he had going on. And so I met him and I ended up becoming his assistant. And he was running a company called Local Response at the time. He's starting to wind that down as he was starting his venture firm, ENIAC Ventures. And it was about three months into the job of being his assistant, like, you know, walking, going to meetings with them, walking his, do- his dog, uh, building the couches uh, for their office, that type of just assistant type of work. But, you know, at some point I was like, yo, I'm working on this thing. Um, what do you think of this? I met this guy, Harrison. This is his deal. And similar to Karthik being putting me on this journey, like Nahal, in a different way, like equally influential and more influential in other ways was like gave us the confidence to say hey i mean you clearly saw something in us that we didn't see in ourselves at the time it was like i want to give you a quarter million and make sure have you go full time on this thing even though it was the worst idea in the world and so now he's a 10 year relationship too and he's seen me grow up in many ways and yeah it's pretty cool yeah what do you think you've learned the most from him <laughs> if you listen to this he's going to laugh like nahal is incredibly positive. He's an incredible cheerleader of people. And he, whenever you walk, you hang out with them and then you leave, you have these great vibes and feelings. And I'm different. Like I, I love to cheer people. I love to be positive about certain things, but I'm significant. I'm very critical. And I'm very like, how do we get better, 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 better. And it would actually annoy the fuck out of me. Cause I'm like, no, I want the feedback. I want to know how I can, like, I want the better critical thinking. Uh, and, and it actually would, so like he helped me so much, but that was the part I was like, Ooh, that really annoyed the shit out of me because I felt like I was failing. I was not necessarily figuring out getting the real root causes to figure out what was going on. Um, but then as I get older, you know, what I learned the most is how important having that voice is, and you just need different roles of people in your life. And like, not one person is all of those different personality traits, but just how incredibly important people like that are 
in the society, in the community, and in the role of the founding journey. So definitely was something, and you know, that relationship, you need to make sure you use it the right way. You shouldn't go there for that critical and honest feedback. You should use it for a different point of view, or when you're not feeling great and you want a sounding board and that type of stuff. So I think uh, I would say that's another learning I would really attribute over the last two, three, four years is how that type of personality can play a really impactful role in the journey of um, entrepreneurship. And then on the flip side, what positive impact do you think you've had on Nahal and the other people you've met, like Harrison? What mindset do you think you've brought that maybe has taught them something and helped them along their journeys? Yeah, you know, I'll speak. I hope it don't sound so arrogant because I've never, I don't know if I, I've confirmed this with Harrison, but I have a feeling I would be somewhere in the direction of the right place. But Harrison, if you listen to this, like ping me and let me know if uh, I'm off. But using Harrison, increased self-awareness on certain things. And in particular, because I'm very direct and, I'll just, and I, I'm not just direct around like, hey, this idea needs to get better. Like if I see like a personality, we all have these personality habits that are ingrained into who we are and molded over your decades of growing up. And not everyone calls those out. Like, and I like it when like, I'm aware of some of mine. I'm not aware. I like when people say, hey, you have low EQ on this thing and here's the consequence of it. Or like, hey, this thing you're doing, this like you talk over people and here's the thing, you know, like I like hearing that stuff and I don't take it personally because I know I got a lot of other great things, you know, but this is just part of life. You got good and the bad. So I kind of by default just exude that same directness back to people that I like. And that gets me in trouble because not everyone's like that. But fortunately, Harrison is totally, is totally comfortable with it. And so I've been able to, you know, when it comes to increasing self-awareness, it's, I can f- find out when he's debating to debate versus debating to find the outcome, you know, and he can be more self-aware. I can be, I can identify when he's really critically thinking and taking a structured approach versus using, he's incredibly smart. So his intuition can get, and natural logic can really get him to a place. So I think it's heightened self-awareness. And then I would imagine like we're very unique spirits, each of us in our own way of like the intensity that we bring. And I don't know. In my life, I don't come across many people like him and he doesn't come across many people like me. So it's like, I would imagine there's a level of understanding of like, whoa, to build something and go for something like we're doing, you need to find these kindred spirits in some ways. And then also like, but they exist, you know? And so I would think uh, that would be another one. But Harrison, if you listen to it and you think there's a third I'm missing or you disagree, let me know. What's the plan now? So you've obviously raised quite a lot of money in the past and you've got the capital there. What are you planning to do with that? What's the growth um, projections you want? What's the end goal of Maestria QA? Where do you want to get to? There's so many ways to define what you're trying to get to. It could be a metrics name. It could be a personal ambition. The way I like to talk about it, well, one is the metrics we get to is just a proxy of doing a lot of the, a couple other things right. So our goal is to get really big and build something iconic, something global, something that's like a brand that impacts thousands, ideally millions of lives through our customers and from an employee standpoint, thousands. But the way we describe it is on three levels, the company level, the customer level, the employee level, and then on the personal level. And I'll go personal, employee, customer in that order. On the personal level, I think startups are the greatest personal growth journey one could ask for. And being a founder is one of the greatest personal growth journeys. Like there's others for sure. But in my circle of option, alternative options, it's not, I don't know if I could find an, a one that's as extreme as this one. And so it's the opportunity to be on this journey and grow in a way that I could have never imagined. Like who I am today, I could have never got here maybe ever if I wasn't on this journey. I might have died closer to where I was at 25 than where I am at the age 80 than where I'm at today at 31. So it's just been an incredible, uh, humbling and maturing experience that I freaking love. Two, on the employee side of it, it's the way I think about like what kind of culture we want is when people leave Maestro, they leave because they found an opportunity that was more gro- personal growth than what we could offer. And then uh, the reason they love my show, if we ask them their exit, why did you, what do you love most about it? They say it was the greatest personal growth journey I could have been on a professional growth journey. I could have asked for something that pushed me to be better and uh, both as a person, as a professional. I think that's the most rewarding thing about out of it. You know, you'll hear things like I really love the people and I loved it. It was collaborative and those things are cool, but I want to be very extreme on how much people get out of it from a personal and professional growth standpoint. So that's the employee experience we hope to get out of it by the time we, as we scale. 
And then on the customer thing, like I've been an under, underdog in my own ways my whole life, or that's been the mindset. I always root for the underdogs. Like I hated, I grew up in San Diego. I hated Kobe and Shaq when they were dominant. And I like the Sacramento Kings as the underdogs. I love the Spurs over them. And so eventually I became a huge Kobe fan when he became the underdog in his own way. But um, I have always been an underdog fan. And it's awesome as a company. We help customer support teams and customer support is a total underdog industry because if you work in it, it's often shit on it. It's often set our cost center. And we hope that we can turn the customer, the folk, we can change the perception of how customer support is perceived from a cost center into the strategic uh, voice of the customer, a core part of the brand experience, uh, a company, a, a or a department in a company that people go to and say, hey, what do our customers love about us, hate about us? What insights do you have that can fuel the business? And the end result for everyone who works in it, which are millions, they're like significantly more valued and empowered. And they it's just a significantly happier job and a more becomes more of a career than a place to be. And if we can do that over 10, 15 years, uh, that would be an incredible impact that would be beyond my wildest imagination as possible. And on the like customer journey side, have you seen any of like piece of feedback in the last few years, obviously since the major pivot, that have really changed your ideas again, maybe not in the same way of the original pivot, but smaller pivots you made along the way. Can you give any examples of those? Sure. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, you, to some degree, we should be reinventing and reimagining the ambition every two to three years and then developing a product strategy that backs it up. And that keeps them motivating for sure. But I would say we probably created a new reimagination in the last 12 to 18 months. That was It was this new reimagination that led to a much bigger ambition that actually enabled us to raise this money. Because when we initially pivoted, it was, okay, For people are running these analysis and coaching programs on spreadsheets. We get customer support teams off of these spreadsheets. Okay, cool. We're solving a problem, making some lives uh, uh, better and some jobs more productive. But then we started getting feedback from our customers on how they want to use this analysis to not just coach their agents, but to figure out what customers are telling them about their business. And we started to see how they were saying, hey, people are coming to us to figure out this insight into the customer experience because we're the only speak people that speak to customers all day. And here's the tools we use. And we're struggling to do that. And so we started, we moved from just like get off of spreadsheets to a vision around customer experience insights. We can actually tell you, we can be a part of enabling you to understand your customers better through the conversations that are happening. And that's significantly more strategic and ambitious than where we were five years ago. So that was only through those customer conversations and hundreds of them, maybe thousands of them that took us to get there. Do you think there's been a pivotal customer that's changed your mind over time? Because I can see you've got some huge names on your website of customers you worked with in the past. Was there any customer you were like, wow, I can't believe we're working with them? Though to be fair, you started with such big customers right at the start with Blue Apron and everybody there. Well, I think there's two questions there. It's one is who, what customer taught us the most about this future? And then what customers are we just like, wow, I can't believe we get to work with these customers. And there's some overlap, but they're a little different because, you know, a customer that taught us a ton was MeUndies. They're a smaller, they're like a underwear company, e-commerce company at the simplest form. They would describe themselves differently, of course. And we saw how much they uh, leaned on their customer service team to get insights into the customer experience and how they thought of co- their customer service team as a huge part of their brand. So that was one that taught us a lot about the future. BarkBox was another one. We saw how much BarkBox connected with their customers through customer service and really built personal emotional connections with them. That was one where like, whoa, this is really cool. And then DraftKings was one where we saw how much they differentiated between their industry through customer service. And we said, wow, that is really cool how they're doing it super differently. And then Stitch Fix is the one I really think about just being the smart, one of the smartest out there where we're, we're constantly impressed with how they use customer service as the voice of the customer. So they taught us a lot. And we're, we're equally very amazed and impressed to get to work with those brands. But, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, the brands that also floor me in other ways because their scale is like Zoom is one of them because we use it all the time. It's changed the world. And we get to be a sp- very, very small part of that journey, but or at least we're on that ride. Shopify is another one because of their scale and how many lives they impact, DoorDash. So the ones that I'm, I can't believe I often have to do with scale uh, because it's like, wow, the amount of people they impact in the world that we get to, at least when they interact with customer service, we get to be part of a suite. 
And then the other one that we can't believe is this company called Coupon because it's based in Korea. And we had to fly to Korea, translate the product in Korean. We had to do all those sorts of crazy things. And Coupon is like the Amazon of South Korea. And uh, that one just is like, how the heck did we get to work with that company? Because like uh, typically even the culture in Korea is they only do business to other Korean companies. So the fact they liked us enough and our product enough uh, to work with us was like, whoa, that just doesn't make sense. That defies the gravity. <laughs> how should the sales strategy change over time as well? Because... Obviously, at the beginning, you would have to work hard to get your customers. But as you got more momentum, how are you finding most of your customers now? So one, one of the big opportunities and big challenges for us, we haven't scaled sales and marketing to, uh, as effectively as we need to to achieve our ambition. So that's what I'm really focused on. And that's probably been my biggest learning opportunities, uh, an area that I, I haven't been successful in building the team to scale sales and marketing. And that's where I'm really focused on. So... The answer if you, it's, it's the same answer as a couple of years ago, which is organic, brand, inbound, people coming and finding our website because they're looking for our type of solution. But we need to be developing significantly more ways of getting the word out um, over the next two or three years. So to, right now, it's people finding out about us and coming to us. But to grow at the rate we want to do and move as fast, we need to build more sales and marketing machinery. And how are you getting so much organic traffic? Is it just through SEO? Or what's the kind of... How are you getting that inbound traffic? Yeah, I mean, it's through Google or our brand, but like you can just imagine like sometimes we're not doing anything special besides being in a great market where people have a pain point that they're actively searching for it, you know? So it's really the the world is becoming more digital and customer service becoming a more critical touch point and the quality of those conversations are becoming more and more important to companies. And so they're like, fuck, like I need to make sure this quality is good. And I need to make sure I learn as much as I can from those conversations. And we're not, we're hard to have, when you have a hundred people all over the world talking to our customers, we need more visibility into those. And so all of a sudden they're just on Google trying to solve this problem and they land on our website and a couple of our competitors. And then it's our job to differentiate, explain how we can help them better, build a product that delivers more value and then make sure they're successful post sales so that they tell other people about us. And what do you think you, that you do best in the competition? Uh, where we're better than the competition, we've gone. So com- some of our competition has gone very wide. They've brought built a lot of modules and that's great for some type of customer. They have a whole suite. We've done one or two and we've gone really deep and more customizability, uh, more, uh, it more just like nuanced features that they need. So it's the depth that we, because that we've really focused on. And that depth is built on deep customer understanding of all the nuances of the way they work that ends up becoming incredibly delightful. So their competition is better in some ways for other customers, but the ones we're going after really value that depth and focus. You've said like you've got the trust you changing now in the future. Can you give us an idea of any of the ideas of ways that you want to gain customers in the future? Partnerships is a huge part thing for us. So we, live, we work in an ecosystem. Our customers use Zendesk, they use Salesforce, they use Qualtrics, right? How do we work with the ecosystem to go, who are also working with these customers, to go and get in front of these folks? That's one way. Two is, you know, how do we just go proactively message folks and say, hey, we're got to go out. Like, he, we have this problem that you might be struggling with because we help XYZ and they have similar challenges. I think it'd be worth the conversation. How do we do that effectively? It sounds easy, but it's not as easy as it sounds. Um, those are two ways. How do we become more of a thought leader in industry that attracts more people to research this problem, make them aware that they have this problem. So and not, the, not rocket science in any of these things. It's more about just blocking and tackling and making it happen. Fine. What's, what excites you most about what you're doing now? What are you enjoying the most? Well, I'll answer that question in a couple, a couple ways. What excites me the most, just purely authentically from a joy standpoint, is the product strategy and the ambition of how we're creating more and more strategic value than where we started five years ago. Like the pivots we're making to add more and more value. That's incredibly exciting. And then two is being working on, like when you go from entrepreneur to CEO, it's part of this journey and it only where you're, you're, the first thing you're building is a product, like a software product. The next thing you're building is the company and that's a product on its own. And that's a people product. And the binding, the bind of the people product is the culture. And what culture you can define as the set of behaviors of how people interact with each other. And, uh, you know, if it's going to sound self, it is a little selfish. And it's going to sound a little selfish and egotistical, but like this just took a some degree mine and Harrison social experiment of how we really want people to work and see if this is the best way to work to create the 
best outcomes on that journey I described earlier. And so I get a ton of joy out of how we're trying to create a very distinguished, unique, in particular culture that's good for some people and not great for others. But for the people who are here, they are hooked on it like a drug and they say, this is the type of people I want to be around. This is the way I want to interact with people. And uh, it's as we want to make that as strong as possible. And I get a lot of joy out of that in particular, because we're going to create a home for a certain type of person that, of a, that they really enjoy. Uh, and then what excites me, because, but it's not, it's a stressful excitement is like, I'm excited to get better at hiring because that's one of my biggest areas that I can improve. And I, it's painful because in many ways I've struggled with it, but I have the opportunity to fix it and get better at it. So I'm excited about one, seeing the other side of that hill, but I'm not positive when I'll get there. Well, it's been a pleasure to talk to you today. Where can people learn more about you and more about Maestro QA? I'm on one other, I talk about the story of Maestro QA on one other podcast. If you want to hear about it, so you type in Vasu Pratipati Uncharted, you'll find that there. You can learn more about me there. You can learn more about Maestro QA if you come to our website, easily maestroqa.com. You can learn more about Maestro QA if you go to our LinkedIn page. We're constantly posting a variety of updates. Thanks again for coming on. All right. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm.